Hello and welcome to this episode of Meet the Characters. The characters, of course, of the Adventures of the Windswift. And I'm joined by Tobias, who plays Jorick, uh, the mysterious uh, psionic mastermind of the uh, the crew of the uh, Starswift. Uh, Starswift? Windswift? It's not the Starswift. It's not, you know, it's not even the Windswift anymore now, is it, really? It's more like the sort of sailing ship with... With holes. It, it's the, the wind kind of swift. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's as swift as the wind, I suppose. We can change it to. Uh, anyway, all right, so we're walking down the road and we meet Jorick. What do we see? Tell us a little bit about uh, who he is. Yeah, Jorick is, um, well, visually, he's, he doesn't stand out that much. He's um, a high elf. Um, difficult to tell age, around uh, 100 ish, something like that. Um, white long hair usually wears a um, crimson leather or crimson uh, tunic or a leather armor depending on the situation he always has uh, a bow with him it's a typical um, elven longbow um, a pair of grayish pants and a pair of high um, not knee high but kind of half shin high boots and leather and the only thing that really stands out would be he wears a face veil, kind of like Sejeti women would do, but it's not like silk. It's more like a thicker kind of um, cloth, which is the same color as the tunic. And if you get really close, you can probably see that his eyes are pink, which is kind of weird, but that's, um, that's what stands out with him. Right. Otherwise, he's uh, normally, you know, decently shaped he doesn't look like he's very strong he looks like he's more on the dexterous side of things nimble right okay so tell us a little bit about the history of jorick well his history is one of those classic really depressing background stories <laughs> uh, and i realized that really only after i made um the character that I, I went through the story and everything I read and I went, Oh my God, this is, this is just the stereotypical, my family is dead story, <laughs> but it fit really well with this character because of where he grew up and what happened. He's from Drakenmoor, the vampire lands. So it isn't a good start for, you know, having a happy story. Um, but he is from Teltana in Drakenmoor and to make a very long story short, he his family was ambushed or <laughs> ambushed is the wrong word because that implies that someone was lying in wait wait they <laughs> wait i'm going into the drag in more accent <laughs> in wait for you. yes <laughs> yes uh, no um they've met a um a vampire's entourage on their way home from a business trip and uh, this vampire decided to feed on his family and their servants Jorik wasn't there. Uh, actually, only his older brother was in that uh, company. Uh, so his older brother, his parents, several servants were uh, killed by the vampires. And uh, the lesser servants were sent home. Like They were worth eating, more or less, and told the family what had happened. Jorik was 14 or 16 at the time. Uh, his younger brother was 14, Athur and his sister Miran was 12. So since none of them were old enough to hold any uh, noble titles of their own, there were minor nobles in Tiltana. Uh, their belongings and their house and everything was seized by the local lord, so they suddenly became street urchins over overnight, more or less. So Jorik tried to keep his uh, siblings alive as best as he could, uh, stealing, cheating, um, that's the reason for his charlatan background. He uh, did a lot of things he's not proud of to keep his uh, siblings alive. And unfortunately, he failed to keep his brother alive, who was captured uh, while trying to steal food and was executed for it, which was unusually harsh. But uh, in the end, it was just Jorik and Miran still alive. And they came into contact with a, uh, a smith master by the name of Solen, and uh, she was a human, rather old, uh, so she had started shifting much of her work over to her uh, journeyman and her apprentices. So uh, Kor, her journeyman, was taking care of most of the, of the work while she was kind of doing administration and stuff like that. But uh, she, she felt bad for Jorik and Miran, so 
cat. So she um, she took them in, she fed them, and over a period of time, uh, he's not exactly sure how long, the, she uh, eventually decided that they could move in with her. Shut up. <laughs> and, um, well, she lived, they lived there for another period of time. He's not really sure how long either because most of this time is kind of lost to him because um, he eventually grew so crazy uh, due to all the mystic shit in his head that he, he felt he was going to hurt someone real bad. Uh, he had already had several bouts of madness where he almost hurt people and just managed to stop himself in the end. So Kor and Miran eventually married um, and Jorik decided, I have to get out of here before I kill someone. So he fled south through Darkenmore. And at first he was just intending to just get away from people. But he ended up leaving Drakenmoor entirely, which isn't exactly legal to do. <laughs> but he ended up at the very, very, very south border of uh, Drakenmoor in the Dwarvost Mountains, where he was at, eventually driven completely insane by uh, these energies in his head. And uh, he doesn't know for how long he was insane. He thinks it's somewhere between 60 and 80 years. He's not exactly sure because... Well, he didn't pay attention to time. He was busy being crazy. And uh, he was eventually found by a wind ship from the Order of Hastari. The oracle of this ship, as they passed over, sensed his mind and figured, that, hmm, we should probably look into this. And they did. Uh, they found a completely insane elf in a cave in the mountains <laughs> who they had to subdue and bring back to the Order and sort of fix him before they could even evaluate him. They only sensed the powerful mind, or she did, and that's it. Um, uh, but she had a lot of work to do to get, get him back into being not insane. So she taught him several techniques of comp compartmentalizing his mind um, and also several techniques of trying to re figure out what is real, what are your visions, um, and keep imagination and real life separate, which was something he couldn't do on his own. He still has to focus to do that because if he's tired enough or battered enough, he will start to get reality shifting in with visions again and he kind of goes bonkers again. So he's a messed up character, but at the same time, he's very, very... <sighs> he has a very strong moral code. And he, uh, he sticks to that because that keeps him sane, more or less. Right. I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> no, I think that was a pretty comprehensive uh, journey that you've taken us on with his history. So what are his goals if, if, if everything is sort of changing as it is? His moral compass is losing, losing north. Well, the, the, thing, the thing is, his moral compass is not external, it's internal. Um, so he... While he respects laws of the land, he's kind of Hastari, which means that he, he operates above the law. And that has also helped shape this internal moral compass. I mean, it's, it's, it's tainted, if you wish, by the Hastari edicts. They are a large part of his moral code. Um, so he will stick to those as much as possible. But he also has his own internal sense of justice. Uh, of what he thinks is right and what he thinks is wrong. So his moral compass really doesn't shift that much um, unless he has bouts of craziness, in which case he might do stupid things. But his goals are... Um, he, he's driven by two things, and uh, that's compassion and fear. Uh, compassion for others. Um, but it's sort of a selective kind of com compassion because he has compassion for those he feels deserve it and who are lawful, if you, if you mind. People who fit into his moral compass, he is compassionate about. While people who fall outside that, he's actually kind of cruel towards because he thinks they deserve punishment. So 
that's one part of him, the, the compassion of taking care of uh, his sister, for one thing. He really, really cares about his sister because she's the only one who's still alive that he has any connection to. So she, she's really important to him. Um, and then he's driven by fear because these 60 to 80 years in the mountains, seeing visions of monsters devouring his, his soul and demons crawling through portals and uh, devouring the world and all that. He's kind of being with the order. He's either convinced himself or the visions were always this way that what he's seeing is the dragons returning. Yeah, we don't know, but he's convinced himself that that's the case. So having these visions constantly of the dragons returning and uh, devouring the world means he's scared shitless of the dragons. Right. So he will do absolutely anything to prevent the dragons from returning. Um, so those are his two main driving forces. The, the, the fear of having the dragons return and, of course, compassion to protect, protect those mm. he cares about. And by extension, that is the fear too. I mean, compassion in protecting them means stopping the dragons from coming back. So right. that's, that's Jorik. Well, that's Jorik. I have nothing more to say on that matter because, well, that's Jorik. <laughs> anyway, thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you, Tobias, for sharing uh, Jorik with us. And uh, you can catch Jorik on the Adventures of the Windswift, which uh, play out every Monday uh, and uh, continue to play out in the far future, hopefully, as the adventures do continue uh, on whatever shape or form the ship ends up being. Anyway, until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming, of watching, of playing. I've, I've got completely lost as where I should be. Anyway, until next time, we'll see you. Now I'm going crazy. Let me go and wander around the wilderness for 18 years. Anyway, goodbye. It, helps. it really clears your mind. <laughs> <laughs>